Okay, so this is the last note I wrote. I took a picture from a Korean military parade. You see all these women completely in sync with each other. I mean, this is very neat. <laughs> they have the same size, the same length of legs, the same size of shoes probably. It's completely uniformous. And then we have here a demonstration. I think this is in Spain concerning the return of the Basque uh, president. Um, it's quite a quite a contrast. And then uh, a quote from myself, from within the note, ultimately the state, well, at least according to Hegel, uh, ultimately the state is the realization of freedom that guarantees the freedom of individuals and citizens. So where is that to be found? Is it on the left? Uh, with the state defining also what can count as freedom? Or is it on the right where the freedom um, to express yourself um, really doesn't matter? I mean, all the procedures in Spain were democratic in um, a more or less formal way but ultimately uh, didn't make any difference. The central government in Spain decided that there was to be no, um, uh, what is that called in English, uh, no separation from that province um, from the rest of Spain. So a lot of questions, more questions than answers, I suppose. But the contrast is wonderful. Two completely separate ideas of freedom and um, both are not without problems. Well, it is interesting to trying to take a look at North, North Korea without prejudice. <laughs> it is a very difficult task. It is. It is. Maybe we shouldn't even try. Um, but it is, it, it's more difficult to look at Spain without prejudice, right? I mean, um, for me, naturally, it was the it was Catalonia or what was it? Um, I'm I'm not sure. Was it Catalonia? Yeah, not Basque land. Eh? Not not the uh, yeah. It was Catalonia? Yeah, yeah. But any anyway, I mean, it's the same thing with the separation of the south of the United States from the north, eh? which gave rise to the civil war there. Um, because they wanted to be left alone with their slavery laws and etc. Um, so it's really the same. No, it's not the same, but it's it's a, a token that democracy isn't um, um, a safe concept. I mean, it's troubled. It's ambiguous. It's. Uh, I mean, my my favorite. Um, neo-Marxist uh, um, uh, theoretician uh, Gérard Bourdieu has a lot to say about the um, in, in Hegelian categories the illusion the illusions of freedom and he is even arguing that the state is not the ultimate power the state is simply an idea that is kept alive among the population that is connected to certain ideals of democracy, freedom, uh, universal rights and all of that. But that in essence, um, the real center of power in any country, in any nation, um, never is the state. So that is something that's sort of in the background of my thinking uh, plays a big role. Um, Oh, well, we will come to all of that. We'll come to all of that. Let's just just try to make the transition from freedom to right to really start digging into Hegel, uh, because ultimately we're going to um, be uh, confronted with a lot of very interesting questions that also um, um, have meaning for our own political uh, life and position. Yeah, but let, let's move slowly towards that. Um, so we are completely, um, uh, how would you call it, Compl completely prepared to deal with them um, on a philosophical level uh, when we get to them. 
because now uh, Hegel would argue that everything you and I are saying about our own uh, national states and the condition of our country is opinion. I mean, that is his very strict judgment. Eh? You have opinions based on your experience, on what you read in the newspaper, on your actual social position within your society. That, that's opinion. But you have to rise above that to get to the philosophy which enables you to give a proper account of what is happening. That's his, his uh, argument, at least. So let's try to do what he um, prescribes for us and see if that is meaningful. Okay. Yeah, let's dive into this transition from freedom to right. Um, so actually, it's what is going on in paragraph 33. Um, and this is the, the in, in, um, uh, is that called fat in, in, um, in English? Um, uh, this black, more black, uh, letters. Uh, in, in Dutch, we call it fat. But, um, both. Both. Thank you so much, Ivana. Oh, I'm, I'm ashamed that I couldn't remember that. Um, so in bold, we have here three statements that sort of um, summarize the uh, the introduction. Um, in, it's a three three stage rocket. Eh? So first of all, the preposition preposition in the anthropology, in our inner subjective life with its desires and impulses, we are fully determined. That's what anthropology teaches us. That's the perspective also of anthropology. But then at the end of that development, in the psycho psychology of it, by an act of the ego, our freedom appears on the scene in the awareness that the I is the formal identity of every human act. So I'm not simply uh, a collection of desires. I am an ego that has desires. I desire something. It's my act. And that happens simply by what Hegel would call the reflection into itself of all these desires and, and impulses, um, reflected into themselves, um, something happens, and that is the appearance of the I. Uh, so I'm not determined by my desire. I am aware of the fact that I am doing the desiring, so I can intervene and um, change the object of my desire or... Uh, stop desiring or at least become aware of the fact that I'm doing that um, simply by acknowledging and understanding that there is an ego involved. Uh, totally different, for instance, from what uh, Friedrich Nietzsche is saying in his Will to Power, where he says that the ego is just the name, one of my desires, gives to itself in order to rule over the others. That's an interesting notion. Uh, so I'm a bunch of desires and what I call I, uh, which to Hegel is the source of the possibility of interrupting and changing and choosing, and etc. Um, to, uh, to Nietzsche is just one of the desires uh, gaining the upper hand. So the I is not formally identical to itself. It's different all the time. So for instance, I want this cup of coffee and I want to impress my wife and the desire to impress my wife then takes the upper hand. So my ego comes into action and says, uh, no, thank you. I already have 25 cups of coffee today. Uh, in Nietzschean terms, that's just the desire to impress my wife instead of doing what I actually desire to do, which is drink my 26th cup of coffee. For Hegel, uh, uh, actually, it is truly an act of the ego. The ego is there to act upon my, um, my desires because it's an expression of a higher power. A higher instance in my um, my being. So when you compare this statement by Hegel around 1819 with a, a statement by Nietzsche around 1840, uh, you see an enormous difference of perspective and opinion. 
And that's quite interesting. Hegel, of course, is um, uh, developing his philosophy along the lines that were set by Descartes with his discovery of the ego. And Nietzsche, of course, is the great anti-Cartesian philosopher uh, who is destroying um, the ego and the ego coquito and everything that Descartes had said about our spiritual nature. And he is replacing that, he is subverting that, or turning it around rather, um, and saying that actually the body is using the ego. So the desires are using the ego as a means for their own uh, realization. Whereas Hegel says, no, from within the life of our impulses and desires, we are supposed to come to some sort of um, expression or realization of the self. Our self-being is at stake. Our spiritual being is at stake. Um, all these questions between Hegel and Nietzsche uh, are very difficult to resolve, of course, because Hegel didn't have Nietzsche to comment upon. And Nietzsche didn't read any page of Hegel with understanding, I'm sure of it. So it's very difficult to bring them into contact. But um, if you look at the enormous influence that Nietzsche had on modern philosophy through Freud, through his opposition to Schopenhauer, um, uh, Nietzsche seems to be the uh, popular philosopher of people who do not exercise philosophy, who do not do philosophy. Um, so if you... Huh? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if you want to know how people think, really think, without thinking, then you have to go to Nietzsche. Um, so this is quite an important statement here, already in the introduction, that there is an act of the ego. The ego is something that acts. Our, our um, uh, spiritual nature is really substantial. It's part of our makeup of our nature, um, which is the opposite of, of Nietzsche's uh, remark. Such a freedom of the ego, however, remains formal, or in other words, implicit or in itself. Um, of course, my the fact that I'm aware of my desires, that I want this cup of coffee, um, signifies a level, a degree of freedom. It signifies the possibility to want something else, to want it badly uh, against all opposition, or to change the object and uh, choose a cup of tea instead, uh, etc. Um, but that I'm free to do so remains formal or implicit, because whether I choose coffee or tea, or uh, skip breakfast and go to lunch, uh, whatever I do, the contents of that act of freedom is dictated by my desires. So this is the level of uh, awareness that Nietzsche might be taken advantage of. Because Nietzsche might say in this context that if the contents of my will is still determined by desires and impulses, this freedom of the ego actually means absolutely nothing. It just means nothing. Um, it's merely the awareness of being dictated to by my impulses. Um, and the only effect it can have is that I restrain my impulses, which is a very stupid thing to do, because why would I? Um, happiness lies in the strengthening of my will and the exercise of my power. And the more I consume, at least at that level also, uh, the more um, I strengthen myself. Um, for Nietzsche, in the simple act of choosing coffee and then drinking it, there is some kind of gratification in the fact that I chose, I acted, and I succeeded. Simply that experience to him is of utmost importance. And Hegel says, well, it, 
is not complete yet. It, it's the, the mere glimmer <clears throat> of the actual freedom that I have. It's, it's the freedom in itself. It's rather like looking, for instance, at a child that is totally determined by its desires, and then seeing that that child has the ability to shape its desires to some extent. Um, like I wrote about uh, the child um, that, of course, acts on its hunger and wants to eat the porridge, but chooses to do so with a spoon, making a mess of it. Um, but in shaping the process of gratification, there is a secondary gratification achieved, which is, let's say, the power of the ego to dominate its own instincts, to dominate its own uh, desires, which I think is a very nice indication of how human freedom arises from within the context of our desires. Now, we also discussed in the, at the end of the introduction two kinds of uh, exercise of the will that sort of give away that a free subject ultimately is interested not in tea or coffee or whatever, but in himself or herself. Um, and that we found in the arbitrariness of the will. Uh, I choose this over that. I choose not to choose. I uh, have a purpose that I follow, that I try to achieve. Many separate acts of will can be combined into one whole endeavor, etc. And ultimately what I want to achieve is that to be happy. And happiness is this very weird kind of gratification that doesn't simply mean consumption because um, I might take the coffee just because I'm thirsty I also might take the coffee um, when it hurts my stomach because I need to be awake um, happiness is a gratification that is spiritual by nature however Happiness is a purely formal concept because to you it's different than for me and for me today it's different from tomorrow. So again, it doesn't define the object of my freedom, but it does express the fact that in all the acts of my freedom, I'm actually concerned with and oriented toward myself. And that is the ideal transitionary concept to go from the pursuit of happiness, which is still totally absorbed within the sphere of my desires. Uh, it peaks above it a little bit. Um, it leads to the discovery that the goal of freedom is freedom itself. So freedom is actually self-related or self-relating. What I want to do in my acts of freedom is to express who I am. Like the child that uses the spoon for the first time, in a way, but without being aware of it, is trying to express himself in, in this peculiar distancing, eh? this kind of distancing going on. Um, for human beings, it's necessary not to be simply determined by hunger, but to be aware of the hunger as a, uh, as an instinct or impulse that I myself can act upon or not. I can maybe go on a hunger strike. Um, I have the ability to separate myself from my impulses and instincts, which is the very fact that makes me a human being and not an animal. Um, so what is my ultimate goal in acting freely, that is achieving freedom. So maybe to be ascetic and to suppress my hunger and thirst and leave the cup of coffee as an object of contemplation instead of drinking it, just to be aware of my strength of will, the ability to deny myself. Uh, that That's peculiarly human. There's no animal that will go on a hunger strike. Um, might not be able to eat because of some kind of illness, but it will never refuse to eat to make a point, uh, which <laughs> human beings will do from time to time. 
Now, that is the actual transition. This discovery that the goal of freedom is freedom itself. As soon as the free will takes itself explicitly as the contents of its freedom, freedom has become a unity of in itself and for itself. It's free in itself because it's not simply determined by impulses and desires. It's for itself because it is aware of itself as something separate from its own um, impulses and desires. Now we have a unity between the concepts of freedom and its reality. That's another way of saying the same thing. Uh, so, uh, whenever I realize my freedom, I am also, uh, also at the same time separate from it, and I'm aware of the fact that the reality, the object of my free actions, are means to an end. They are not ultimately my goals. They are means to an end, and that is the establishing the establishment of my freedom. So, in principle, we now have made a transition between the subjective and the objective spirit. <coughs> if subjective spirit discovers that it wants to be a subject, that it wants to be a person, that it wants to express its freedom and not merely be determined by uh, human nature, uh, then it discovers its true freedom. That is why we can say that right is the realization of that freedom. So we... Um, in objective spirit, we are talking about objective realities outside of my subjective perception that at the same time are totally mine uh, in the sense that they express my identity, they express my spirituality, they express my nature as a subject. And that is this peculiar unity of objectivity on the one hand, there is a reality outside, but it's a spiritual reality in which I can recognize myself. It is the fact that something that exists externally is at the same time an object of freedom. Now that is what paragraph, what is it, uh, 29 was saying. However, and now comes the important thing, however this transition is just in principle. It's just on the abstract side. It's the final notion of um, subjective spirit that we reach here. And now we have to make the transition. That is something important also in Hegelian method. That when we reach, reach the end of um, uh, a development, there's nothing, let's say, there's nothing within subjective spirit that needs to be made explicit. Everything that was uh, implicit is now made explicit. And now we reach the stage that we have, uh, seemingly, we have to jump. We have not only to um, make the transition between one category and the other, but we have to make a transformation as well. That is something within Hegelian methodology, methodology that is under debate. How do we do that? How did Hegel know that we had to go to freedom? Uh, of course, he's saying that freedom was implicit in all the previous categories, and now that freedom has to be stated as such as the goal of all the former categories and the inner ground of the former categories as the concrete, more concrete shape of the former categories. But that's under debate. You can debate that. Um, but we still do not know what this contents is. That's the problem that we have merely the abstract concept of freedom. It's the higher concept in Hegel's system. But we still uh, are at a loss what the true content of liberty is. In what kind of objectivity can freedom realize itself? That's the question. In what we want to have, in whatever we want to do, the ultimate goal must be our own liberty. Sure. But what does this entail? How can a freedom understood like that be established within objective reality? What are then the existences, uh, the existence, um, our translation said, that express my freedom. Now, um, you can think about inner thoughts, inner actions that truly express um, my freedom. I mean, Sartre said that in existentialism, it is said that the capacity to negate, the capacity to say no, even on the torture, even when you um, betray your companions uh, of the resistance to a to an SS officer, 
uh, even then inwardly you can say no that, that's the example that Sartre gives in Lettre et le Nion, being a nothingness uh, of the ultimacy the absoluteness of uh, liberty um, is that an expression then of liberty that liberty then is totally subjective and you can fill it with whatever you like uh, you can your comrades but you can inside yourself you can say no yeah it's still absurd yeah, but it, it, it leads to something quite interesting. Um, in a play by Sartre, uh, Le Diable et le Bon Dieu. Do you know that? The Devil and the Good God? Play by Sartre? No. There are three stages, three acts in that play. And the first one is freedom used completely negatively. Um, the... Um, uh, main character called Götz, which is German for um, idol. Um, Götz uh, chooses for, um, or was it the other way around? I'm not sure. Oh, he chooses, no, he chooses first, he chooses for the good. So he's co a completely moral person doing everything what is right. And then in a Hegelian turn, everything that he is doing right from his own perspective turns out to be evil for someone else. So he chooses to do evil, because if evil is the result of him doing good, he might as well do evil all the time, at least then he is consistent. But then it turns out that to be evil means that sometimes he is evil for someone, which is good for someone else. So being evil is not a consistent way of uh, living, because doing evil things can be a good for someone else. So ultimately, what it, does he do? He chooses freedom, which in this case means that he marches with uh, the communists in the third act, uh, slaughtering people who oppose the revolution, which is evil, for the greater good, which is the communist revolution and the new society, all the while remaining completely free because he isn't really a communist, and he says that to his companions. I'm not really believing this, but it is, to me, um, a very good way to live. I'm, I'm in solidarity with you. And if you do something wrong, I do something wrong with you. And this has even echoes in Zizek, but let's not go that far. The fact that uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, all these atrocities happening because comrade solidarity, that is actually pretty, very much true. I think clinical psychologists would agree. It's what happened in wartime all, all the time. But here it's, it's a choice. That, that's peculiar. That, that even sicken them because of solidarity. Because sure. Why would they leave their comrades do uh, those things? And they, they can't walk away from those people. I think that's yep. the motivation. But interestingly, that position by Sartre's, in Sartre's existentialism that does take something from Hegel. I mean, had good, evil, and then a combination of the two in solidarity. And all the while remaining completely, however abstractly, uh, free. Um, that is totally uh, denied by Hegel. So, it, it actually, it turns out to be the opposite. Uh, that is libertarian existentialism is the opposite. I've uh, written down the sentence. Uh, I don't know, is it from the comments in 33 or uh, from the text? But what constrains me and uh, seen from the perspective of formal liberty actually ex expresses my being. That is what I wrote. And it has to be expressed somehow. Yep. That, that is what I wrote in the previous note. Very yeah. useful for me. Okay. Okay. It's very useful for me because uh, that, that that is opposite of Sartre. It, it can't be something subjective. Yes. It it has to be. I have I have to recognize myself in, in mm -hmm. the objective world. But the, the 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 difference between Hegel and Sartre is not um, uh, in the fact that Sartre recognizes this abstract liberty as being. Um, part and parcel of our existence. Hegel acknowledges that as well. But this idea that the only way to 
um, achieve real freedom is to live in solidarity with a group or with a revolutionary movement or with society is like a, um, a dualistic version of what Hegel is saying. Hegel is saying, I recognize my freedom in the social institutions of society. Sartre is saying, I go along with these institutions, but at the same time, I withdraw from them and remain free in an abstract sense as well. So for Hegel, my individual existence actually is a gift from um, my social life, is something that is achieved within my social life. For Sartre, besides being determined by my social life, I remain in an abstract sense um, uh, free. So Hegel puts this in this in, in this development going from abstract individual freedom to realized individual freedom and freedom as social freedom. And Sartre is uh, changing that 90 degrees. Uh, no, wait a minute, 45 degrees, <laughs> and 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 saying no, wait a minute. There's always this underlying formal um, uh, freedom of my consciousness. Um, I always am aware of the fact that I choose for and within society. The nice example that Sartre gives is the letter that he got at the beginning of the occupation of France, where this boy uh, told him that he had to make a very difficult moral choice. Uh, either he got out and joined a resistance group or he stayed at home to take care of his mother with all the risks that came along with that. But that was his very real moral choice. And uh, Sartre said uh, in his response, uh, I cannot, cannot tell you what is the better choice to stay with your mom or to go into the resistance movement. I cannot tell you what is the better choice, but I can tell you that you have to choose as if you were choosing for humanity itself. So that you have to make a kind of choice that from then on is what you will defend against everyone. This is what I had to do. But there is no kind of morality, there's no kind of social morality, there's no kind of um, uh, state-funded um, or state-grounded uh, idea of the good that will give you a guideline in that choice. So you have to choose as if the existence of the hum uh, existence of humanity depended uh, upon it. And that means that the, this notion of abstract or individual freedom in Sartre's existentialism uh, takes the upper hand over what Hegel would call our embeddedness in society. Now, of course, Sartre is thinking of the uh, dissolution of society in um, a, a war situation under occupation, etc. When exactly the societal conditions of my personal freedom are threatened or are dissolved. Um, and Hegel, of course, is thinking of the ideal state, which has peace, quiet, and justice and liberty for all, where I can truly um, uh, give myself up to the social institutions of my society because I can trust them, because they truly express my individual interests, both uh, my interests and my freedom. But nevertheless, I think there are two uh, opposed concepts of uh, of liberty. Let's re read on a little bit. Um, it's necessary for freedom to make itself objective, to realize itself, but in order to do so, freedom has to lose its subjective shape. This is the transformation I talked about. The notion of freedom goes through a decisive transformation. In this transition, our freedom enters into a different mode of existence. It's no longer about my awareness of my possibility of choosing as an individual over against others. It's about the existence of certain rules, regulations, institutions itself, beyond me. Objective spirit means a spirit that achieves existence within the external world. There's reality out there. Um, it's not about me wanting the cup of coffee, but about the question uh, to whom it belongs. 
who has the right to use the cup of coffee it's a totally different question it has nothing to do with my inner voices my inner desires it's something that i have to discern within reality and now he says i can only be truly free when my freedom exists before me as an objective reality so now i'm uh, aware of the fact that the cup of coffee does belong to me and then i know that i'm truly able to um, consume it without any response from others, etc. Now I have recognized my liberty in something external. So my liberty within myself to uh, take the cup of coffee and drink it before anyone can uh, prevent that is here uh, in opposition to my liberty in recognizing that this cup of coffee was given to me or belongs to someone else, in which case I have to leave it alone. Now, that to him still is recognizing my liberty. Um, and why that is the case, he still has to um, argue for. He has to explain that. And he does so in the concept of property by showing the intersubjective dimension of property, by showing the reciprocal element of property. Claiming something as my property involves acknowledging the property of others. Withdrawing from the use of something that is the property of someone else, um, instead of merely limiting my freedom, actually. Uh, is the affirmation of a condition of my freedom. Because if I can't take what belongs to him, he, therefore, can't take what belongs to me. So my property is recognized uh, in, what, in the same act in which I recognize the property of others. So that is the first abstract stage of this. Now, this is important. The subjectivity of freedom is not completely lost. It, it's within this inner life of impulses, etc., that I need to become aware of the objectivity of my freedom. How is the subjectivity not completely lost? Because I still am and remain and can be the subject that desires a cup of coffee. But so that is not lost. Subjectivity has to be completely lost. It has to become objective spirit completely. But, but I do not live in a world that is only um, made up of rights and duties. I also live in a world that has to satisfy my needs and desires. That is not lost. I mean, property and contract and all of that organizes a life that is also, to a certain degree, determined by desires and impulses. That, that, is, that doesn't go away. It merely means that I have this, that my, my liberty must work in such a way that the, uh, that I have, that I can have a reason to limit my desires, um, on the basis of a spiritual reality, which is merely the fact that it is marked as belonging to someone else. So my freedom is realized not merely by the ability to do something, but also by the ability to recognize the limitations of my actions. Not as mere limitations, but as actually uh, also the conditions of my uh, freedom to act. So it, it, it all boils down to the uh, phrase that you mentioned earlier, uh, that to um, recognize the limitations of my freedom while at the same time those limitations being recognized as the conditions of my freedom, that is true freedom. But <clears throat> um, the point is that we, in the philosophy of natural law, people stand in opposition to one another because they are defined as being finite, uh, beings uh, filled with desires and needs and concerns. Um, so they are deficient in some way and uh, they are therefore um, consumptive beings and uh, there are hunters and gatherers and in the exercise of that kind of freedom which stems from my um, uh, needs 
I can come into conflict with others who desire the same thing. But people do not, in, in, at least not in modern societies, people do not interact like that. They interact in a world that is highly symbolic, um, in which something like, yeah, uh, spiritual freedom is expressed. That is what we have. Um, the, the first thing I ask when I see an orange is, whose orange is it? How much uh, does uh, uh, the philosophy, the philosophy of, of today, whatever we find today, how much does it owe to Hegel? <laughs> well, ninety-five percent. Because when you when you explain, start explaining Hegel and uh, finding connections. It seems like quite a lot. Sartre is consciously responding to Hegel. Um, Nietzsche has no choice than to respond to Hegel because Hegel has truly understood, um, let's say, European culture at the beginning of the 19th century, what, what Nietzsche, of course, has to address as well. I mean, to the degree that Hegel's philosophy is able to express some kind of inner unity, some kind of inner ground of the whole of European culture, religion, art, uh, uh, social life, um, the collection of sciences, human sciences that was there as psychology, anthropology, etc. Uh, in as much as he was able to express all of that in his system, everyone after him has, uh, consciously or unconsciously, has to respond to him. So Sartre does so. Well, you were mentioning that uh, uh, our interactions are highly symbolic. A lot of people yep. are coming uh, from uh, uh, starting uh, from that point, and of course, all of this is uh, present. Uh, all of this is present in Hegel. Yes, yes, it is. In a way, maybe the, in a different vocabulary, in a different way, because it was a different time, but all of this is present here. Yeah. I mean, even a very astute Hegel commentators fall into the trap that they take one single uh, movement within Hegel's philosophy and declare that to be the ultimate um, principle of uh, everything. I mean... Uh, if you have read Kojève, by any chance, is uh, 1929 lectures on Hegel. It's difficult. I, 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 I yeah. But it's interesting. I find it very uh, engaging and interesting. Well, I, don't, I don't know how much it has to do with Hegel. <laughs> Hegel and how much it sounds more hmm. like uh, uh, some, his own thoughts inspired by Hegel. At least it, sure. But the main thing is that he, he saw in Hegel's phenomenology one categorical movement that to him was the principle of everything. And that is the, the lordship bondage, um, relationship. Um, so many people who follow Hegel to some extent take out the one principle and use that. Um, and it's very important to, see the whole of Hegel's system and what he tried to achieve with all of the philosophical sciences that he um, brought together. Uh, for instance, when we are uh, going through the philosophy of right, sometimes it's necessary to remind ourselves that objective spirit is not the final word in Hegel's philosophy. So we have subjective spirit, logic, psychology, anthropology, um, we have objective spirit, uh, abstract right morality and social morality. But beyond that, we have absolute spirit, which is art, religion and philosophy itself. Um, we have the overarching concept of history, which is touched on in the philosophy of right with the notion of Weltgeist. Um, because Hegel's philosophy actually is a philosophy of the history of spirit. So, um, when you look at the, the totality of the system, there's so much more that can be said than just um, what Hegel is arguing for in his social philosophy. I mean, did, did you know that? Are you aware of that? That for Hegel, 
art is a higher expression of of uh, seems to Hegel's system um, as some sort of uh, on some sort of schematic level. So we were, for example, when we were studying aesthetic, uh, listening to lectures in aesthetics, we had to learn Hegel. But of course, um, uh, uh, that was just uh, that wasn't really we we didn't really get a chance to really 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 uh, read Hegel as it is. We were just using all those the the electrical movements. We read them as a result. Result. Yep. But now you're going beyond that. <laughs> now you're studying not just the results but also the method and it seemed like so, so when I first encountered uh, phenomenology then I, I, I was like wow this is uh, this actually makes sense because when you get when you read about the results and you read about this uh, scheme of things or scheme of uh, Hegel's systems then you don't really get anything and uh, you can't really understand why no. it really matters. So then you get to say all sorts of nonsense, no. uh, nonsensical things because that he's racist or whatever. Exactly. The things that uh, completely, when you start reading it, then you yeah. start realizing that it actually makes a lot of sense. But this, most of the interpretations of Hegel are quite comical because they begin by ignoring one of his main principles, which is that there is no such thing as a simple proposition that expresses truth. There is only truth together with its, um, with its procedure to arrive uh, at that uh, proposition. Uh, uh, that's in the um, preface to the phenomenology, uh, that statement. So you could, you could make, um, presumably, an anthology of Hegelian statements um, to uh, prove that he is a racist or to prove that he is a Europa-centrist or that he is politically uh, an authoritarian thinker or whatever. But um, then you forget that the meaning of every proposition in Hegel's system depends on the former and the latter and the place in the development and um, that Hegel never gives mere opinions, but he's trying to develop something from within. Uh, and if you do not understand how that method works, then it's quite it's simply comical to, um, to, to use Hegel for anything. I remember I... I'm still stuck, I listen only to the first lecture, but uh, uh, the guy, the guy that you, the Whitfield or whatever he is, he is explained in a very good way that Hegel is not using any sort of models and applying them. Good. Good for him. He explained it in a very, very, very uh, decent way. And yeah. approachable way, so it was very useful. Okay, then I'm glad that I uh, made the reference uh, to him. Um, I, I, I thought he was um, decent. The first yeah. lecture was dedicated to that because uh, that Hegel actually solved the problem. Because if you mm. have some set of norms that you're applying to the to to your problem, then you have to come up with a solution where did you derive those norms mm -hmm. you have a problem here and he in Hegel and that's fantastic uh, when reading Hegel it seems like really what you said that uh, Derrida said that he is a master ch chess player he has, <laughs> he has it all covered and he has all problems solved and when I I mean it's maybe it's not fair to compare anyone to <laughs> to mind uh, to to the mind as Hegel but when I read some articles that I can find on J JSTOR I can sometimes I find fantastic articles mm -hmm. sometimes people don't have these methodological issues covered and they mm -hmm. come up with some sort of model that is either borrowed 
or their own or uh, adjusted in some sort of way and they applied to some things which might be legitimate for some sort of essay or mm. something, uh, some form in journalism or opinion or something. But in philosophy it doesn't work. And that is, that is why I realized precisely why I enjoyed reading Quine, though, though I don't know much about analytic philosophy. Because Quine, uh, uh, he's totally counterintuitive to me. Mm. He's very interesting and engaging. He has it all covered. He has all problems solved. So when I his, read his article, not his book, but his articles that are commenting on specific issues like uh, Noam Chomsky's, um, what is the name of his transformative grammar? Mm -hmm. Uh, when he's commenting on that, I know exactly because I read his books, I know where he's coming from. So I know how he solved his problems in ontology, in epistemology, and uh, I know uh, how, uh, what, are his, uh, what are his standpoints. So he resolved all those things. So that kind of writing uh, makes sense to read. Otherwise, it's just writing for the writing's sake. Mm -hmm. But Quine is an original philosopher, which you can't say for many commentators that uh, try to explain Hegel, but they don't have a, a personal viewpoint or the, the, no awareness of what dialectic uh, actually does and how it works. And uh, I find that I uh, I don't want to waste my time with that. Anymore. There are a couple of. Uh,